Good morning. Uh, my name's Adrian. I'm from uh, our customer care manager at Broadlane Leisure. I'm just about to demonstrate a Fiamma F45 rollout motorhome awning. Uh, so I've got my young assistant over on the far side. Uh, we do need two people. It literally is just a case of just balancing the awning as it as it rolls out. So the first thing we need to do on a manual operation, there are electric versions of this, but this is a manual uh, variant, uh, is to actually put this arm and hook into the eyelet at the top on the awning and then you use the crank arm to be able to extend the awning out. You, you roll it out so you've roughly got about four feet of awning extended from the side of the, of the vehicle and at that point just relax with the crank arm, probably a bit more actually because I'm not quite that tall. <laughs> uh, so that sort of position and then you come to what is where the location of the legs are. Where we need to come. Okay, so first thing we need to do is release the lock nut, which is at either end of the arm. You pull the arm out on the outer edge first so that you're actually drawing the arm away from the outer edge. What that does is allow you to pull the foot away from the red brackets in the middle here. So that, that foot goes behind the red bracket and locks in place. And then you load the leg down and you undo that lock nut to extend the leg out slightly. Once you've got the leg to a reasonable height, and you've done the same on both ends, like so, it doesn't have to be perfect as long as we get it somewhere close. Uh, then you continue with the crank arm to extend the awning out. Now the difficulty is these roof rafter arms are bent, uh, they're obviously cranked in the middle, uh, but they, you don't want to extend them fully out. If you extend it fully out, you do find it very difficult then to get them to collapse back in again. So you're actually doing it so you've roughly got about a six inch uh, deflection of being straight. So, can you wind that out a little bit further? About there is roughly where it wants to be. If you extend it any further than that, you will then struggle to get the awning to, to retract back in again when you come to wind it back in. Adjust the height so you've got roughly the right height, uh, so you've got good head clearance. And these arms then, these feet, go uh, vertically, directly in onto the ground, and they have a couple of peg holes which you can then uh, drive a couple of pegs into the floor to obviously stop wind from lifting that out. It's not going to be perfect, of course, obviously if you're in very strong winds or stormy conditions, my recommendation is that the awning does get retracted back into its housing. Uh, they are fine for summer days, obviously, giving you providing your shade and in light winds. But if it is going to rain, things like that, this canvas can collect water in it and it will belly uh, and then that will stretch the, uh, the canvas material, uh, which then can have difficulty in it winding back in. So just precautions, if it's wet, windy, put the awning back down again. Uh, so that's the awning in the upright position. And now I'm going to actually uh, put it away for you again, just so you can see the process of actually putting it away. So uh, what we're gonna do is just relax the legs. So we're gonna wind it back in again now. So I've got the crank handle out again. And instead of going forward, I'm now retracting it back into the housing. Uh, put it into position where we feel comfortable that we can manage this. So, just release the lock nut. That's this nut here I'm referring to. Just release that. Uh, you bring the arm back up, like so. Slide it across, bring it upright. And the first bit you need to do is to bring the leg so it's on the inside edge. And then you extend it so it goes behind the red cap. Fortunately, my uh, camera lady's just not quite tall enough for me. <laughs> uh, so I actually just needs to do that. And that one's in location. And now I'm going to do this one my side. So what I'm going to do now is just slide that over. And what that's done is just pushed it in at that end. And now I've got that tight. I'm going to just do the lock nut back up again. Is that 
and that's nice and tight. And then we can actually now bring the awning all the way back into its housing again. So uh, what we're gonna do is just crank that back all the way in again. And as it comes into the housing, it will locate itself and finish flush. There we go. That locates itself fine and it's finishing flush on the bodywork. And that's how the awning works. Thank you very much. Um, initially, what I want you to imagine is that we have attached the services. The services are your gas cylinders, your water, your mains and the laser battery uh, in a motorhome. So that they are all attached at this moment in time, uh, but we cover that on another video. Uh, so if you can appreciate that that's already been done, uh, the first areas I want you to pay attention to is going to be above the entrance door here, because uh, we're going to uh, the dis distribution board. Um, so the first switch that we need to come to is the one that's immediately on the left hand side. This is your 12 volt laser battery symbols. We can use either the vehicle battery or I could be using the laser battery as a power source. So middle position is an off location. That's to draw off your vehicle battery or you could use internal power from obviously off your laser battery. Um, the voltmeter uh, is indicating the battery is in a very good state which is also confirmed by the solar panel regulator here. When I've got flashing green lights on the very top edge here, it is telling us that those batteries are full. So it's actually got full uh, batteries, 12 volt batteries at the moment on, on the vehicle. Uh, the other button to the right hand side is uh, a test button for the water supply to tell us how full the onboard water tank is. And it's approximately a third full at this moment in time. That is indicating the 12 volt battery. That is indicating water level. Okay, so hopefully that part's fairly self-explanatory. The next switch along is uh, for the water pump system. Uh, and to make it live, you need that switch on. And the very right-hand switch uh, is for the exterior awning light. So we're, we're gonna just come pan back a little bit further from that. And I'm just gonna open up a cupboard door because this, on this particular model, the awning light protrudes also internally. And as I operate the switch, you can see that the awning light does come on and is illuminated. But while I've got it on, you have got another isolation switch there. So if you haven't got this switch turned on, the one above the door won't operate that bulb. That has to be live first, and then the switch above the door will operate. And also, if you do need to change a bulb, you can do this internally. Unfortunately, with these rubberized gloves on, it's a bit difficult to get to. But you just remove the uh, little window panel there and you're able to get to a standard tungsten bulb. That's a 21 watt bulb. That's how you replace an awning light. OK, so covered that area very quickly, actually, above the door, which is quite nice. Uh, not too complicated. And I am going to come to the rest of it, but I am just going to open up the wardrobe door because Internally, what I'm just about to show you that on the back wall is we've got the battery charger, we've got the consumer unit, the uh, the trip main trip system. We've also got a small bank of fuses here, which are all 12 volts, and a relay switch. Uh, don't worry too much about what the relay switch does; uh, you can ignore that altogether. But these fuses are obviously for different appliances. Um, and I'm just looking around here to see if I've got a sticky label, which I haven't, to tell you which does what. Uh, unfortunately, it's not uh, it's not evident, but let's just come to the main side of stuff for a moment. Uh, the trip. This is the RCD residual circuit device is what RCD stands for. And if I press this little button in here, I've now lost mains electrics, as you can see. All that I need to do is turn that back on and mains electrics is now coming through to the different supplies. And these two are called circuit breakers. Circuit breakers are the same as fuses. But a circuit breaker trips out. You just take off the offending appliance. Let's say it's that one there, which is saying it's the fire. Uh, I'd reset the system by lifting that lever back up again. Now that's a fuse, as I say, it's a miniature circuit breaker. These, if these blow, you have to replace them with standard fuses. These, are, that's a standard car blade fuse. You should be able to get replacements for either from places like Halfords or something similar to that. Okay. The other two switches down below here, the beige switches, one's got fire written onto it and the other one is for the water heater. Now this is to get it to work off mains electrics in both cases, but they are the first switches that you come to, to, to turn those systems on. They're not live at the moment. 
because you do have to then uh, turn on other wall switches to make them uh, a live circuit. Okay, so if we pan back out a little bit further, I just want to lift that up because underneath here, underneath this shelf, uh, we've got what I call the gas manifold. So this is the gas supplies coming in. I'm just going to have a quick look which way it is. I'm going to say that's the gas supply coming in. And then these are the takeoffs going off to the different appliances throughout the system. Continuing on from that, that is the gas manifold. And when a tap is turned to right angles to the, to the pipe that it's serving, that is the supply off. And if I turn it back again, that is the supply on. You can only rotate that through 90 degrees. It's either on or off. You cannot rotate it in any other position apart from that. They are both live at the moment, supplying the, uh, the items that they're serving. The only other thing I need you to pay attention to in here, this is your water heater. So that contains, as it says here, 10 litres of water, approximately two gallons. And over on the right hand side, we've got the pump itself, which serves the motorhome internally, uh, drawing water through the system. And we've also got a drain down valve. That's that yellow uh, valve down there. When it's horizontal, it is in the closed position. So it is serving the system. It, when it's vertical, you'll hear it drop water in a moment. There it goes. When it's vertical, you are losing water underneath the floor of the motorhome and it is draining your water heater and, and items like so. All right, so that's what you've got underneath this wardrobe area. And uh, just to repeat myself about the, uh, the taps and what they've served, you can obviously see the indication here, uh, just to say that that's what that's for. Gives you the right position, just in case you forget. Uh, and that's what we've got in the wardrobe. Right, so let's go around to start working some of the appliances. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the lighting circuits first, if I may. All the lights within this motorhome are on a 12 volt basis. Uh, they're not working off mains electrics uh, directly. So they're, they're not mains lights, these are all 12 volt. And as you can see, uh, these have all been converted to LED bulbs. Uh, so as I, forgive me if it comes too bright, but there's the LED bulb on. And it's just a, a light switch to the side. These do rotate, so you can rotate them to any particular position to make it so that if you are reading a book or something like that, you have got illuminations on that rather than illuminating inside. So just to show you that they're all working, there's just that switch there. Uh, coming over onto this corner on the off side, that's that one there, and then we've got this other one here. Okay, while I'm also here, there is a, th uh, a light to the fixed bed area above the cab, um, and it's just around the corner, and it's that bulb there. Now that's a halogen bulb, so the rest have been LED, where they've been converted. They would have originally been halogen, which is what this bulb is in here, um, and basically, no, that one's not been converted at this stage. It's down to the end users, should they wish to. These are also uh, LEDs, as I can now see. Down lighters coming through. Uh, and I've now just got to find the light switch for those because I uh, haven't done that in advance. One. And just to continue with that, I've now located the light switches, which are literally just by the entrance door. So there's a double light switch. And also there's a, a, a directional arrow a switch. The directional arrow switch is for the step, uh, so it electronically retracts, or you can electronically put the double step out. Okay, uh, these light switches then by the door are going to be for the down lighters. So this is now operating the one at the front end of the cab area, as you can see, that's the top one. And the next one down is operating the one that's uh, above the entrance to the bathroom compartment, toilet compartment. Uh, it also does the one above my head here. Okay, so that's the bottom switch does those two there. In the kitchen area, you are gonna have a couple of little work surface lights, which illuminate the work surface. And again, they look to be, uh, halogen, they look to be halogen bulbs to me. So uh, just to be aware of that, they, this is where a customer has converted some of the, the lighting circuits already uh, within the vehicle. And as they come through into the uh, toilet compartment, uh, I have got a pull cord, which is to turn on all these lights. So that, when I say all, uh, the one light that's in the toilet compartment, it's a down lighter again, it's a halogen bulb I can see. And that's how you uh, operate that particular light. You can only do it via the pull cord. There is no other switch for you to worry about. Right, I'm gonna come out of there for now because we've covered the internal and the external awning light. 
we're going to come through to the water system. Um, so we know where the boiler is, which is at the base of the wardrobe. And what I have established already that the drain down tap is in a closed position. But again, in the base of the wardrobe, that's that yellow valve and it's in a horizontal location. I've quickly also made sure that the taps are closed in the bathroom. And I also want to make sure that this tap is also in a closed position, that's down. If the lever's up, you're going to could potentially get water run out and if it was over a work surface all of a sudden we flooded the floor area so that's what we've got here so make sure the taps you're in control of the system is basically what you're making sure the levers down position the faucet so it's into the bowl and not onto a work surface put the tap into the cold position first and raise the tap the pump does cut in and it's drawing water out of the onboard water tank and then uh, through, the, through the tap system. Well, I've got a steady flow and I haven't got that yet because we uh, might need to fill the tank up a bit more. We're going to see where it goes. I'm going to just now put it onto the hot side just to see what's actually happening and see if I can get it to fill quicker. Right, okay. So what's nice is I have got a nice reasonable flow of water coming out the hot side but we must be very close to having uh, that tank empty. I want more water than that. But this uh, characteristic that you see where the water is stopping and flowing again, it is standard. Uh, you have got air in the system, it's trying to purge that air out the tank at the moment. And if I can't get a steady flow of water out there, I am going to have to uh, unfortunately break off again okay. uh, to put more water in. But uh, I just want to see what goes. I don't think I'm going to get any sufficient water. Okay, let's try again. Three, two, one. So the tap is now in a closed position and the faucet is actually located over the bowl as opposed to being located over a work surface. And as we open the tap up, all the water goes over the surface, if you're not careful, onto the floor. Once we've got it and we're in control and we've made established that the red light is on for the pump to run, we open up the, the position of the cold tap over to the right hand side, the outside wall there, raise it and get a steady flow of water through the cold side of the system. We've already established it and pre-bled the system already on this vehicle. So we have got a nice steady flow of water flowing out on the cold side. Once you've got that, you would then rotate the tap through to the hot side, uh, over towards the window at the rear, and again, fill the onboard hot water tank up. Bear in mind, do remember, it contains 10 litres of water. So initially, when you're first setting the system live, you actually put in 10, uh, 10 litres of water, two gallons, into that hot water tank. When that tank is full, you should then get a steady flow of water, as we've established, through that side then. Once I've done that, I can actually introduce a heat source to the boiler. And I don't ignite the boiler until I've actually got the boiler full. I don't have to bleed the taps in the bathroom. In the toilet compartment, I only have to have the kitchen tap done. Uh, we, we'll do that at a later stage. So. If you can recall, we've got the uh, two red switches on uh, in the wardrobe, the beige switches with the red illumination lights on it. And what I'm looking to read up here is the Ultra Store. The Ultra Store, because we're storing water, it's a storage situation. So just at the top there, it says Ultra Store. And on this dial, it says Ultra Heat. Uh, so that's for the room heater. And this is actually for the water heater. And this is to operate it on a gas system side of it, not mains, but gas. So what we do when it's on gas, uh, well, there is, sorry, can I just stop it there a minute? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So ultra heat is on this side, which is the room heater of the motorhome. So to room, uh, heat the room temperature. And I say, this is on the uh, ultra store. What you do is rotate the silver dial so that it's into the gas location there. Uh, and that is to set the water temperature. So on the gas side of stuff, you can actually change the temperature within the boiler. The maximum it can go up to is 70 degrees, quite warm. Um, in fact, really quite close to scalding. So do be aware that when you are operating the hot water tap, when this is working, uh, it can get very warm. Don't have the water aimed at you if you're having a shower. Also, just to aid you on the water side, on the Ultra Store, I've removed already the external flue cow cover, which is outside, because uh, it's a balanced flue boiler. 
What you need to do to be able to remove that, I don't know if you can uh, zoom in on that little image there. What it's saying is you press it in the middle here and at the same time as pressing inwards, you put it that way. And what it does is just lift these two little lugs off a little latch and it just pulls right forward and then it drops to the floor. It's, it's, it's that process. So you push it, you pull it back at the same time. That's the double process you need to remove that blue cow cover. If that's not removed, the uh, fumes being produced and the air oxygen that is required for the boiler to work, uh, it will fail. And as you can see at the moment, we have got a green light on the auto store system. There's a green light there saying it's, it's working fine. If you get green and red there, it's telling you you have got a gas, a, a, a failure for some reason or other, mainly because of this, or that the gas supply is not actually reached through to the boiler first within 10 seconds. So you can operate it just on gas alone. We can also operate it on mains electrics, as I said. And I said they were the only switches, uh, the first switches. They're the only switches now I've realized. Uh, what I was looking for is something else similar to this dial here. Again, saying ultra store. It's not located in this vehicle. So the beige switches, which are in the wardrobe with the illumination on, is the only switches which bring supply to those particular appliances and they do turn on at that point. I'm contradicting myself there, so I apologize on that. Um, while I'm also here, I may as well do the, uh, the ultra heat at the same time. So what we've got here, no, I'm gonna contradict myself slightly. <laughs> uh, this is mains now, not, not gas. This is mains electrics, because what we've got here, the silver dial, as you rotate it, that's now gone off, as you can see the green lights disappeared so that's the off position that little that little nipple there is the off position near that o you rotate it and you can see i've got 500 that location there and a green light come on rotate it again i've got a thousand which is one kilowatt if i rotate it in an upward direction that's now two kilowatts and there are reasons why the two and the 500 and a thousand are separated from the 2000 so i'm going to come to uh, the reasons why as we come round towards the boiler itself so this is your fire, your heater itself. This is what heats the room. So bear in mind about that control. I'll come back to that in a second. This is the gas side operation of the fire. So I've got the valve and I've got a piece of igniter. So they're the first two items there. On this side, on the fascia, we've got what we call blown air. Now blown air is a fan that draws air over the heat exchange, heats it up, and then pumps it out at floor level. Around the various areas within this motorhome, you're gonna find round ducts. There's one on the edge of this bed frame down here. There's a round hole down there. Yep. And uh, there's gonna be one in the bathroom. You're gonna find another one down by the door, I hope. Can't see the one down by the door. Can't see any more that I'm looking for right now, but there will be more than what I've shown you, i.e. that one down there and the one in the bathroom. Uh, you normally have about four in total. Uh, but that's where then the heat is generated out of those holes and that's what's uh, operating that, that flow. But let's come to the gas. Turn it from zero all the way around to number 10. When I've got it in that position there, I press the valve down and hold it down. And while I'm doing that, I then simultaneously press the piezo igniter. And also while I'm doing that, I'm looking to see if I can find the, the pilot light. Where I locate the pilot light is looking approximately at a 45 degree angle through this little uh, window here. And if you can just, uh, forgive me, I'm gonna just hopefully see if I can get it in the right location. Ah, says he, there it is. There's the pilot light. Now if I could keep the camera steady in the right location. Thank you. I'm gonna release it. Did you see the flame come bigger? Yeah. There's pilot light main burner so what i'm doing to get the main burner i'm releasing the valve after 10 seconds so i've got it depressed release and the main burner cuts in so that's what you're looking for is you're looking through that window just to see if uh, if that works and now i'm producing convection heat from this area here um i haven't asked blown air to i haven't asked blown air to work with it uh, so that's not working at the moment, the blown air side. All the heat's being produced inside the caravan is coming directly from this area going upwards. Uh, so down at floor level, you could have a cold floor space. 
uh, and that's where you use the blown air to actually draw the air in at down at floor level, direct the heat down at floor level, and you get a more even ambient temperature. Number 10 setting doesn't mean a great deal to anybody. Uh, there's no particular uh, temperature associated to the numbering from one to 10. It really varies on different size of vehicles that this heater can be fitted into. Um, so what I say normally, if your vehicles are around about the four, 12 to 14 foot size vehicle, normally operating one to five, you might find sufficient to keep a caravan, uh, caravan or the motorhome uh, warm. Uh, but if you're on larger vehicles, then you probably need it higher, operating on the higher numbers to establish the similar heat. At the moment, we've got it operating on 10. I'm just going to rotate the dial down because I'm going to tell you when it goes down onto pilot light again. Because obviously today's warm. Okay, that's just gone down to pilot light and it's around about just below the four where the pilot light's dropped into, into play. If I rotate that just one segment, there it is. Did you hear the boiler cooked in? It's cut in again and I'm just below the five. So you can play with that to establish what you feel more comfortable with within your particular motorhome, how you want the heat to be. Obviously in the winter time, you are gonna need it operating on higher numbers. The reason why I've shown you that is because when we come to the fan, we can operate it in conjunction with this particular uh, thermostat there. Right, the blown air, is in an off position. This is a 12 volt fan, not mains, this is 12 volts. That is off right there with that single dot. I'm moving the, lo the locator switch either to the left, which is a manual control. You are manually setting the speed that the fan operates at. So I can go all the way down to one or I could bring the speed right up to number five. And you can hear, hear the increase in, uh, in the flow, airflow. That's off, as I say. And if I put it in that position there where the A is, it's automatic. It works in conjunction with the heater itself. If I've only just turned the heater on, the heat exchange is cold. The fan only turns over very slowly. As that heater gets warm, uh, that fan senses that, and then it will operate at a higher speed level to uh, distribute the, air, the heat that is actually generated. But it will only work to the highest speed level where you leave that switch to be. So if you only ask it to work to the highest level of three, that's the highest it's going to get to. If you rotate it to four, that's gonna be the highest level or five. So the variant on automatic is one to five right now, or one to four, or from one to three. They're the variable span speeds that you can have when on automatics. Well, I normally say if you're on five and above, you need it on a higher fan speed. If you're on five and below, you can operate it on the lower fan speeds. Number three being halfway, so you separate that how you wish to. Now that's working with gas. The beauty of this particular fire is you can also use it with mains electrics at the same time as using it with gas. So you've got double the heat output that uh, you can have with some of the heaters. Uh, so I'm asking gas to stay on. And now I'm coming back up to the wall switch, which says ultra heat. And remember me coming back to this 500 and 1000 setting and 2000. Right, so that's half a kilowatt, 500, half a kilowatt. 1000, one kilowatt, 2000, two kilowatt. The reason why it doesn't go 500, 1000, 2000 is because on the lower settings, any of the 1000 or the 500, I do not have to have blown air working with it. However, if I decide to use it at two kilowatt, 2000, I must have blown air working with it. The heat that it generates is very powerful and needs the assistance of the blown air to distribute the heat that's being generated. So that's the reason why 2000 is in a different location to the 500 or 1000. 500 or 1000, you can just use it as background heat without a blown air working if you wish. And again, if I don't get a red light on there, uh, I know the system's working fine but you can get red lights and red lights are normally warning along with the green. If I've had it working on 2000 for a period of time, say I've, I've used, been using this now at that setting for an hour, the first thing I want to do is to turn it off. Now do remember, I have asked for the fan to work with it. That fan wants to continue to work for at least another 30 seconds after you've removed the heat source. If you haven't removed the heat source, 
uh, and I turn the fan off, the next time I come to operate the fan uh, or, or the heater on mains electrics, it won't work. It's got a thermal cutout switch built into the system which will stop it from working when you come to turn it on. So just be aware of it. Just allow 30 seconds after you turn that switch off there to allow the fan to continue to run. When it's on automatic or manual, I'm not worried, but just allow the fan to continue to work. It cools the heater elements down and stops it from tripping out next time. Hopefully that makes sense for you. So to continue, I'm now going to operate uh, the refrigerator, turn the refrigerator on for you. Uh, we do have a transit latch here, uh, so the lock position, let's just make sure that's open, and that is the lock position there. Uh, so that's the catch over to the outside, uh, to the entrance door, is in a lock position, and for normal use, it's obviously just over on the left hand side. To actually operate the fridge, to select the source of uh, energy that we want it to work from, we're turning the dial from zero to gas if we prefer, which you can use on site. Uh, I'm going to also put it onto uh, mains electrics, or we could use it whilst in transit on 12 volts, which will be that location there. Um, at the moment, we're not getting an illumination here because we need the ignition system on the car to be live. We need the engine turning over for this switch then to actually illuminate up, up here with this little small LED. So at the moment, it won't work on 12 volts because we haven't got that facility uh, set up. But when you arrive on site, you either would select mains electrics or gas. Mains electrics is straightforward. You obviously need to be coupled up to supply and just make sure those trips are live, which I was showing you earlier, the MCBs and the RCD. Uh, and this is the thermostat. So the higher around the scale that we go, so that's its minimum setting. Its highest, coldest setting that you can establish is the switch in that location there, that little uh, tick there. All right, so that is uh, its coldest setting that I've asked it to work from at the moment, and it is up and running. On the gas side of stuff, it's all automatic. Uh, just wanna make sure there's nothing to press in, which there isn't. You've just got to turn it to the gas symbol. If I was quiet, besides the rain, I can hear it actually uh, trying to ignite, the igniter's trying to work. And if it ignites within a certain time frame, as I say, bear in mind I can't press these valves in. Uh, if it uh, ignites within a certain time frame, we should get a continuous light, which we still have. And I know the igniter switch is now just actually turned off, so I know it's actually up and running. Uh, that's already done so. I could possibly generate a failure for you if I can find the switch that I'm looking for. Uh, if I can find it. I apologize if I can't, but let me just see what I can find. Right, what I'm going to do is just turn off one of these two taps down here. I've talked about the gas manifold previously, and we've got two more uh, isolation valves down here. If I'm just going to rotate this blue one, uh, which is the supply that feeds the refrigerator, I know it's already tried to start to ignite, and it's going to fail eventually. It probably takes around about a minute for the failure to occur, but when we get a flashing orange light, it's telling us that the refrigerator's gone into a fail mode. Um, and I'll tell you how to overcome that in a moment. So we're gonna wait for it to go to fail. But while I'm also waiting for that to happen, I may as well tell you that the green valve serves the cooker system. And the only reason you'll actually turn these isolation switches off is if you feel that you've got a failure of gas, a breach of gas coming into the vehicle. Here we go. So I get an orange flashing light. I'm gonna turn the supply back on. It won't try to ignite automatically. I've got to clear that failure. So to clear the failure, just turn it off, turn it back on again, and it will go through the sequence of trying to ignite. And that has already ignited. I could hear the switches actually stopped, uh, the, the igniter stopped working. So my fridge I know is up and running, and I've asked it to get to its coldest setting. You would certainly use it in the south of France on the cold setting without a shadow of doubt. Uh, all, all UK, vehicles are really set for uh, UK temperatures. Really in the south of France, sometimes we need assistance of additional fans to get greater circulation on the back of the refrigerators, but that's if clients go to, uh, go to France or Italy or something like that, where we do experience higher temperatures. But the freezer box, I can assure you, is cold. Uh, do you want to put your hand in there, my colleague? 
Oh yeah, freezing. <laughs> so the freezer box is actually cold and it is up and running and has been working for a period of time. Uh, so I know that that's working. Unfortunately, we haven't got any light illumination within the refrigerator casing itself. Uh, we're just uh, working on daylight or, or electric lights being provided to uh, illuminate the area. But that's the freezer box there. Right, on the travel catch, I just want to point out something. I don't know if you can see, on the travel catch there's like a claw system here. And there's two positions. There's that position there or that position there. The first position, the one that's closest to me, is when the refrigerator door is locked and hasn't got any ventilation. The second position, which I'm going to open the door up slightly and just try and find it, oh, says he, there, that is ventilated. Now this is for winter storage. This allows air to flow in and stops mildew from building up inside the refrigerator. So over a winter period, you have it in a ventilated position. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out. So that is that second position there. Um, and that's what that is. I've, I've got to put that back on, which is I've just located it in place now. Right, so that is the travel catch. When I come to turn it off, just do that and the supplies are now turned off. There is no reason for me to turn off the gas valve unless I feel I've got a gas leak coming from that appliance, in which case I can isolate that and still use the rest of the system. The remaining part of the system is your cooker then. Um, and on this side, we need to make sure that we've raised the glass lid as high as possible, as vertically as we can, and we're back against the back wall. Uh, some of these items have uh, gas shutoff valves associated to them, and they normally have a little series of writing down here giving us uh, some warnings, i.e. don't close the glass lid down if the burners have been working for a period of time, because we're going to have residual heat build up onto the fret, and as you lower that down, that stuff in the glass, if it gets heated, it would shut up. Uh, the other thing is it's got sometimes gas shutoff valves, as I say, it stops the uh, gas from working. If you lower the lid down, it would automatically shut the supply off. In this case, we haven't got that system, but other models we do. This particular valve here is to operate the rear burner at the back there. This one is for this burner ring. This one is for this one, and that one is for the small one at the rear. We've got three medium burners and we've got one small uh, lower burner here. I'm using a gas match to uh, get these items to, to work on the hot plate. So just keep the valve turned on uh, in that location, depressed for about 10 seconds and then release. And that's high and there's low, as you can see. Uh, same goes again. High and low. Uh, and if I come across, So just take note, this is a smaller ring. It's meant to be smaller, obviously. Uh, more for simmering of items than anything else. Um, so obviously these are more for cooking with. So that is the uh, hot plate operation. As we come into the grill area, lower the grill pan door down. That's the grill itself. Um, I'm just gonna move that to one side. And I'm gonna turn this valve on this time. All the little zigzags squiggly a bit above it. Uh, I'm going to turn that to the full flame, strap me the igniter again, press the valve in and get my hand in the right location to ignite the burner. Uh, so I'm just going to make sure. Now what I'm now doing is actually looking into the reflection of the base panel of the grill because I can actually see the flame better rather than having to try and squeeze my head down there sort of thing. But the flame is on, I can see we've got a good flame, it's heating up the uh, fret uh, and if I release that now that's on. Uh, but I can obviously lower it down to a lower flame, which you might be able to pick up on the on the base panel there. So can you see that base panel? That's mm -hmm. high, there's low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we've got the off position there. Mm -hmm. So that's your grill pan. Sorry, your grill working, and there's the grill pan. Uh, you might have to put that in on a bit of an angle to actually uh, get it to locate properly for transit, so you can close that door up all together. And the oven door opens to the side. A lot of things uh, lower downwards, but on the oven door, on this particular model, it goes to the side. Now, on the oven, we have got an igniter. This is a SMEV system, and we have got an igniter. So this is the thermostat. Press the valve in, and I'm going to come across onto the left-hand side, the piece of igniter, which does ignite the oven. Okay, and away she goes. Uh, now, that's set at number six. And the flame won't vary itself, although I could turn it right down to number one. It's not going to vary itself until I've closed the oven door up. 
uh, allowing heat to build up within the oven uh, because then it will regulate itself like it does on any domestic uh, type style oven. And I say, you're just gonna have to play with these numbers. Normally regular 06 is the position I'm in right now, about 220 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is the off location there. Again, just point out those two gas taps on the other manifold that we found. So the green one is for the uh, cooking facilities, the blue one is for the refrigerator, and that's just for gas and, and turning it off. Okay, so I just put my hands on these just to make sure they're cool enough. At the moment, that's not quite cool enough for me to lower that lid down, so I'm gonna leave that to uh, disperse the heat first. I'm now going to go into the toilet compartment just to show you the uh, toilet. I'm not going to demonstrate the shower because uh, I have had the shower today. <laughs> uh, so I will show you running water through on the, actually I can show you running water through on both just so you can see it's working. So cold position on the vanity basin, raise it, be careful. It is quite powerful. In fact, probably move it over slightly. And that's it working on cold. I'm going to now turn it through onto the hot side and hopefully you're going to start seeing the steam arrive, which you can. And that's now working on hot, and believe me, that's going to be very hot water. So please just be aware of it. Do not put your hand straight underneath items like that. You do need to use it and operate it as a mixer tap. Yes, by all means, get running water through first, and then bring the cold in to then make it so that I can keep the fingers underneath it. Just be aware of it. So the noise you hear is the pressurised water pump building pressure back up into the system. On the shower hose, as I say, forgive me, uh, I'm not gonna have a full shower. Uh, all I'm gonna do is put the water over the basin. I'm gonna bring the tap to the cold position, raise it, get the water through first. There it is. Quite a powerful little shower, actually, these things. Uh, you're certainly gonna get wet. And then rotate it to the hot side to get hot water through. So as you can see, that's quite warm. You're gonna need to bring the cold in. That's still too warm for me to shower under. That's about right, okay. So you're gonna have to find the, the correct position to what's right for you. That was halfway roughly between uh, hot and cold. I had it in about that location there. So it's about halfway to make it so I could stand underneath the shower. Mind you, better mind I do like hot showers. Okay, uh, it will drip I'm afraid. Uh, what you could do if you want to stop that from doing so, uh, just break the connection there and drain any water out the shower head and possibly a little bit out of the hose as well by just giving it a quick wiggle. It has got a rubberized washer at the bottom of, the, of that union, or that little black thing, that circular black thing. Uh, so just be aware that you haven't lost it. And then tighten the shower head up, put it back up there, and hopefully stop the dribble. <laughs> uh, we have got a shower curtain provided by the manufacturers, and it does circle all the way around from one side of the wall through uh, a 90 degree angle. But really all it needs to do is cover up the actual door itself. Uh, the shower curtains are like any shower curtains. Once you get them going, they tend to actually waft against you. Uh, it's just unfortunate that's just the way it is on this particular item. Uh, so that's the shower curtain. Come to the toilet itself. And again, you'll be very pleased to hear, I'm not gonna give you a full demonstration. Sad as I am. <laughs> okay, so. In this particular case, with this particular manufacturer, the Zephyr toilet here in a motorhome situation, is that we haven't got a fresh water tank for flushing purposes. It draws water from off of our onboard fresh water tank, which is located underneath the vehicle. So as I press this button here, the blue button here, I am gonna get uh, a displacement of water around the bulb. As you can see, put the desired quantity in, uh, sufficiently and you come to then to this little grey lever here and I'm going to move that lever backwards and as I do that that is going to disappear as it has done I'm going to seal the tank back up again so flush it let me just show you the flush again there's the flush the water's coming off the onboard fresh water tank that water cannot bleed back into your system so don't worry that you think you might get some issues with toilets you know I don't know, uh, going back, back into the tank. It's not going to do that. It's a one-way valve only. It cannot transfer any water back into your fresh water tank. Uh, but there's the flush water ready. And to dispense of it, this lever backwards. The water drops down into your holding tank. 
and that should be the flush all complete. Uh, you close it again, obviously, because you don't want any smells coming back into the uh, motorhome. And that's it. It is a swivel bowl, so you can put it into a different location to make it more easier to uh, sit down on the bowl should you need to, etc. etc. Uh, into the bottom tank, you will put a blue blue loo chemical. Uh, you can use Aquachem, is one particular manufacturer, that's the manufacturer of Thetford, they use a product called Aquachem. Uh, but there are many different toilet fluids available. Uh, we ourselves at Broad Lane have uh, taken the trouble also to do our own uh, toilet fluid, which is a lot cheaper than what the Fetford uh, manufacturers are. Uh, it's a premium toilet fluid, and this is what you actually put. It's got a measuring uh, window on the side, and you put a certain amount of that into the bottom holding tank, and that breaks down any ablutions that are produced. So you do need that uh, in, in the bottom holding tank to do, be able to do that. My also my recommendation is please don't use domestic quality toilet tissue. Uh, do use uh, products that you get from caravan dealers uh, or on, on sites at parks and places like that. It is dissolvable toilet tissue. If you use a domestic quality tissue, Andrex, just to name a brand, uh, I'm not employed by them in any way, shape <laughs> or form. I will ask for commission later. Uh, but it is such a solid material that the mechanism, uh, this blade retraction, uh, gathers the toilet paper up and it stops working. And then you decide you can't clear it, you don't know what the reason is it's happened, you bring it back to the dealers. Dealers have got to get their hands down traps and things like that to clear the mess that's down there. Uh, it's not a, a job any of us like doing. Um, and certainly I haven't done for at least 20 years now. So please uh, bear that in mind. Do use dissolvable toilet tissues when operating the toilet if required. Okay, so I'm now gonna to come to roof vents, and roof vents and windows and blinds uh, to cover all these areas. Uh, and I will come back to smoke detectors and things like that in a moment as I've just passed one. Okay, so this is called a Hecky 2 roof vent and basically it's the large version. At the moment, uh, we have got these two levers in, in position like that. That is a locked position. This lever just turns actually, it shouldn't do. Right, okay, a bit different from what I'm used to. I was expecting that the only way you can get that lever to work is by pressing that button in, in which case it should turn then right quite easily. But let's put it into the open position, which is that. I am going to open this very quickly and probably close it again because we have actually unfortunately got a little bit of a rain uh, cloud overhead. So that's the fully raised position. You can use the handle to do that of course. So let's do that again with the handle. There, raise it up like so. Yeah, and that handle then retracts back like so. So that's the first position. That's fully ventilated and you would use it in that position certainly uh, uh, in, in hot warm conditions. Right. I've now put it into, and I've used this handle into a different location. I've locked it in position. I don't know if you've seen the turnbuckle catches that I've just turned there. Uh, so I'm on about a little black catch that comes over the top. You can go either way, but it comes over the top of the handle and it stops the, air, the wind from lifting the, the roof vent up. If it was a windy condition, it gives you about six inches airflow from the back going forward. Right, so that's the second position. The third position is more for nighttime use and you just want a little bit of ventilation. It allows a half inch gap. And what I'm doing is just rotating that into those locations. It gives a half inch gap here uh, and it's in that position there I'm referring to. Uh, and that allows just a small amount of air in during the evening, but still makes the roof vent very secure. So that's this one. In fact, that's the only roof vent, probably one in the toilet compartment. I'm just gonna check for you. Ah, there is another roof vent in the toilet compartment. So back into the toilet compartment, which I apologise. Uh, to remove the fly screen, we just push in on that tag a little bit to allow the frame to bend in to come past these two lugs here. And then we grab the handle. We have to grab this brown bit and we pull it into the handle and then we raise it up. So same again, again, pull the handle in and raise it up. Now at the moment that's fully up, or we could have it tilted one way or the other, or just at an angle purely down to you as to how you rotate that to be in a preferred position for you. Once you've got it in the desired location, just bring that frame so it's caught on those two lugs there and there. Once you've done that, that's it. 
Uh, that's fully down at the moment, obviously. For transit purposes, these vents must be closed. You don't have them open for transit. Okay, so let's come to windows. All the windows are going to be the same, but I'm going to just demonstrate it on this particular one here. Um, so open up the window levers and the window pushes outwards. And then to lock it in position, just tighten up uh, the thumb screw there. Okay, so that's nice and tight on that side. You get one on the other window stay on that side and that would hold the window out. And that's in an open position, as you can see. When you finish using that, you can open the window further if you wanted to, just change the location. Uh, when you want it fully sealed, says Adrian. <laughs> right, this one's not gonna close uh, fully. What that is, is just allowing a small amount of ventilation in this location here. What I'm trying to achieve and what I was trying to do, and I will achieve it, but not right now, is as you see this window arm here and stay here. See how that's now not in the middle position, that's fully closed. All right, so my, my predicament I was having on that side was it was going into the ventilated latch there. I can run my fingers past the rubber where I can't do it now. Okay, that's sealed. So that one I've got to work on that particular side just to, uh, just to get that in the right location. So at the moment you can see my fingers go past the rubber. So let's do the fly screens and blinds. Imagine that worked for me. Uh, that is your fly screen, which is only downwards. Uh, you haven't got a, any other position, either up or down. Uh, but on the blind, as you can see, that is a down location on the blind. And if I rotate that, sorry, move that into different locations, it can lock out, say six inches down, 12 inches down, or fully down. And when I'm pushing it back, it's locating it into, I'm pushing it back, look, we're going into a fixed point. Right, so that's the process there. Fly screens are either up and down. You don't have open or halfway positions. They are, are either open or closed. And I know that's going to be the same. So don't worry about that. I know they're okay. And while I was on that roof vent, I should have, of course, done, demonstrated the fly screen on that one. That latches over onto the blind on this side. What I've done is just release it. There's a little trigger there. So it's locked in place at that point and holding in place and I've released it now. But that's the fly screen, or it could be the night blind, which is for night time. You don't want to have uh, the moonlight shining. Uh, you may be like me, vampire. Get scared of the moonlight. <laughs> so, coming slightly forward. We're gonna come into one, uh, one of the bed areas. So uh, this makes into a double bed over the cab. Uh, and the first, this is normally the transit position, so that you can start come into the driver's position from here without hitting your head, up, head on anything. But when we're ready to use the bed, we actually release the two uh, travel latch bolts, which is that one there, I'm bringing it inwards and putting it into that position there. So a little travel latch. I'm bringing that board forward. So it does that. Shouldn't go down with too much of a bang. Uh, but that board, comes into that location when we've got the mattress in place. It stops anybody from falling out of bed. So it's made, when the mattress is in, to actually lift up slightly and you bring it back down to locate anybody from rolling out of bed this way. So that's a rollout board that they provide. I'm just gonna ignore the, the rest of that bit for a minute, because we've got to now stand on the furniture. This is your step ladder to gain access into this area. Um, and you would locate that onto these two brackets here one two and let that just sit that's fine i can walk on that that's fine i can get back up there now without too much trouble and as you can see we've got two mattresses i'm not bothered which mattress you bring forward uh well, actually i'll bring the bottom one forward i am bothered about which mattress you bring forward i want you to bring that one forward which is the smaller one of the two this one's larger in length uh it's actually also slightly th this is a thinner mattress compared to that one, which is a thicker mattress. So that sits around this wooden frame. That's the reason why I brought this mattress forward. I would then bring this into this location, as I said, and that stays in place there and stops anybody from rolling out of bed this way into the open area. So that's how you make a double bed up in this area. 
Yes, you have got windows. Yes, you have got the latches. And yes, you have got fly screens and blinds. And that's on either side. So just be aware of that. When you come to put it back, all that you do is lift that mattress up. Slide that mattress underneath it. Carefully. And you push it right back as far as it will go, which is about there. Uh, I would now put the ladders on the top. Uh, but I'm obviously standing on them, so... There we go. Put the ladders on the top. Because they can travel on there for transit. You could actually locate them between the two mattresses if you want to stop them from sliding around. And basically, you're just lifting the board in the centre. So this board just pivots. Okay, it's on hinges. And then you get it into the location where you need to bring it back. Oh, that wants to go over the top. That one needs to go over the top. And get the shooting bolt in the right place. So see, there's the shooting bolt in place, and the shooting bolt is now in place on that side. That's your double bed, overhead double bed. So the other beds that we also have within the vehicle, uh, this makes up into a double bed, and I've preempted it a little bit. I've drawn the slat board already forward, which comes from off the outside wall there, and I've also brought these two arms out as well. These are just like side support arms to that particular seat area, as you can see. We just bring that so far out, you use this particular slat board with the uh, additional piece of framework there and locate it into that position like so. Your mattress that makes that area up then is still the two backrests that come into the middle here. And then this part of the backrest on this side, which is a single bed, you can actually put down the centre there and that gives you uh, your base. This is a solid board on the back. That's a solid board. So that is to... The, uh, the actual frame itself. You sleep on this side in this particular case, which is a little bit contradictory to everything else I've uh, shown you in the past. But at the moment on this particular vehicle, that is to that area there. And this is the sleep inside on this particular bed area. Uh, you'd also then bring these, as you see, that's a solid board again. You'd bring that backrest and this backrest into this area here to form the remaining part of the mattress. That gives you a double bed. This lose the two armrests and you've got a single bed on that side. Uh, so quite a variable uh, layout uh, and it's purely down to the individual on how uh, they wish to use this particular motorhome layout which is more suitable for them. So I'm just going to put this quickly back for you. I'll also put the table back in place for you just so you can see the operation of that. So they push back either side as you can see. Uh, the slat board you just lift up slightly because it's caught on the leading edge just there. So that's locked in position. Just raise it over that position and then slide that slat board back and over like so. And then the table latches onto this particular arm here, the rod. The table for traveling position is in the side of the wardrobe here. It's on the side wall of the toilet compartment. And I've actually uh, got two turnbuckle catches to release first. That allows it to fall forward. You then grab the table and lift it out of the holding bracket at the bottom. You need to remove it out of that bracket. That comes across first, the mirror, and then the door. Right, so these two little lugs here, you can see you've got latches which slide across and they go underneath that rod. So basically position it onto the rod and put the leg down at the jet, push those arms back they now can't lift off, as you can see. You grab the table leg, and there's a, a lever here, which just operate, just release it, and that brings the leg down and locks in place. And there's the, the table in location. You can, if you want to make it a little bit easier, push that little tag down sometimes and move the table over slightly. So it makes it a bit easier from either side to gain a, uh, entry into the seating area. So if you want to bring it back the other way, push the lever down, bring it back this way. So if you prefer what they're eating or drinking and you want to make it more available to yourself, just move it this way. All right, so, anybody think I'm an alcoholic? <laughs> uh, so that's one area there. I am going to also uh, just expose where the onboard water tank is. I've spoken about it, but I haven't actually shown you where it is. It's filled externally with like a petrol cap. Uh, excuse me for a second. Yep. This is uh, rem already been removed. It's the water tank uh, filler cap itself, and I've actually taken it out. 
and there's two keys but it's not that one closest to the ignition key it's the one that's closest to the key fob which actually serves this particular product all right so i've actually removed it already to fill the system up uh, here is the onboard tank these are the poles or the support arms for this arm when it comes out so don't feel it's going to tip up on you because it's got no support it's actually within those tubes so it's quite quite strong in its use so what we've got down here uh, this is for cleaning purposes uh, you remove that if you want to gain access into here and try and clean the internal uh, fresh water tank obviously uh, it does need clean from time to time and as we were also looking down there and you found it more quicker than what i did is the drain is the drain down valve the drain down valve is that sink plug right at the bottom the red thing so to drain that tank unfortunately there's no other way of doing it put your hand in you grab the rubberized bung there's he and you withdraw it like i have done and water's now dropping down onto the floor you need to do that uh, when the vehicle's not being used in any long uh, in, well, not being used for a period of time because otherwise this water will get stagnant uh, which will then taste a little bit like TCP when you come to drink it uh, so I recommend that you do drain those systems down if it's not being used for a period of time and that's the lock position for that this pipe that comes in through the side that is to fill it so this is where it fills these are the sensors to tell you how full the tank is so that goes across and obviously the takeoff points as well uh, there's the sensor there I don't think I've got anything going on that side. Right, so this is uh, the drawer off. This one is an overflow pipe. It actually drops down onto the floor. Uh, and if you get water dropping down on the floor externally outside, it means this tank is full. You can't get any more in there. That's the top point. Um, but it just gives you a visual indication outside that that tank is full, besides the, uh, the dial above the door, of course. Okay. So... That is that. You can see you've got Velcro on these cushions. It just aids the uh, base cushion from sliding. You've got uh, the opposing uh, Velcro bit on the on the seat already. So bring it in as far back to that as possible and just lower it down. And that is on the Velcro and now retained in place. Okay, uh, I think I've covered most of it. There are mains points within your caravan, uh, within your motorhome. You've got a double mains point on the Welsh dresser area. Uh, sometimes there's one in the kitchen, but I can't see anything in the kitchen area for you to worry about. So that's going to be your nearest mains points here. Coming into uh, the TV area, uh, going back to the original owner, he has put a bank of sockets here. Um, which is possibly for things like a DVD player to be attached into it or probably even a, a, dish, a satellite dish of some uh, digibox of some sort uh, but it's not there as standard at the moment but you can see the proper connection is that's the 13 pin plug that's just the extension and you've got a coax point here and you've also got a 12 volt point here but if your TV works off a cigarette socket you've got a conversion that you can put into there and there's your conversion for your TV on a cigarette socket to work. This particular appliance is a mains one on this one. Uh, and forgive me because I don't know too much about that telly. That could be your own or it could be one that's just been left in with the customers. Uh, so that's with it as far as I'm concerned. Um, the controllers are all here. That is obviously uh, when you don't want it on display. Uh, uh, say so There may be other main sockets around the vehicle. Uh, I can see I've got one on this bed frame here and you may find another one in the driver's cab area, although it'd be very unusual. And say, so, today's demonstration, I hope you found this very useful. Uh, if you do have further questions, by all means, we are available at the end of the phone. Uh, within this vehicle, there is owner's handbooks, both for the engine side, which is a Fiat-based Decato, uh, but we also have then, obviously, the habitation side, which is all, all on, based on a Swift product, or be it Bessie car, and uh, read the handbooks first. If that's unsuccessful, you're unable to overcome something, by all means, put a phone call through to us and we will try and help you further if we can. It's always very difficult when you're at one end of the phone and we're at the other and we can't envisage what you're looking at. So uh, photographs are often very useful or video call. Let's have a conference. <laughs> all right. I hope you found that very useful. Uh, thank you for your time and uh, all the best. <laughs>